Um, Pam, wow. Thank you so much for sharing your story. So very emotional, so very vivid, so very true, and um, uh, so very illustrative of what's happening across the board, not just with your individual uh, situation. Can you just imagine, or can you just share with us um, how different the outcome of your lives um, with you and your children might have been if the judge would have sentenced you to a non-custodial sentence? It, it just seems unfathomable to me. Six years where you might have not have gotten anything if you've been able to afford to go into the um, whatever the treatment program. If you had not gotten that sentence that you got, tell us what would life well, I think that um, we were still reeling from um, grief, um, loss of my husband, and that just created a foundation um, of just continued. It was like cascading over and over, something else, something else, something else, and never having that basis of, of real mental health and real um, healing um, to start from. But if we had the community resources. We had we had treatment available. I had an undiagnosed, untreated uh, mental illness and didn't even know it. And um, but could have. I mean, the kids could have stayed in school. They would have um, had friends. They would have been able to develop relationships that they hadn't been able to develop. And and at home, I mean, the family was completely ripped apart, and there was no there was no foundation at, anymore. And so it's just been difficult um, knitting that back together, you know, and trying to move on. Kids trying to become adults while they're still trying to heal from the, the disruption of their childhood is, is significant. And I think that we feel that in communities across the, across the, uh, the country. It's common sense. Keeping families together is important, and it develops uh, a foundation for our, for our kids to grow from and become healthier. We have healthier communities. And I mean, kind of our mantra at work is that public safety isn't a system. It's an outcome. So let's start striving for an outcome that works. Wow, well, thank you so very much. And I'm so very glad that you and your family have been able to reemerge as a, a strong family unit. Dalton, I mean, what can I say? You are just one incredibly talented, young man, you're going to be going far, many, many uh, places. Um, I'm really glad that you were able to share your spoken word right here in the um, hallowed halls of the Congress, shall we say. Um, but what I want to ask you is that I hear it time after time after time. Some people think that children of incarcerated parents are the next generation of incarcerated people themselves, or criminals, shall we say. I'd like to hear from you what you think of that fear that you hear it spoken out there. Are there certain steps that policymakers and direct service providers can take so that youth can find their way and can thrive? Well, I think it comes down basically to the point of nature versus nurture. If a child does have an incarcerated parent, their nature isn't exactly the most conducive it can be. So you want to make the nurture aspect as strong as it could be. So with things like extracurriculars or after school activities or in the case of the incarcerated parent, alternative options to the incarceration. So I think pretty much what we've been talking about today is how we're going to help the next generation you know, stop perpetuating themselves back onto the system. So pretty much just staying involved.